Hey YouTube, so today I want to talk about hard problems and I'm going to begin with the hard problem of consciousness. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the hard problem of consciousness, uh, but the basic idea is that um, consciousness uh, does not seem to be susceptible to uh, anything like a kind of standard scientific explanation. It, it seems that if we ask, you know, why, why or how does consciousness exist, um, it seems like the you know normal explanatory methods that we have in science are just not going to uh, answer this. So um, you know the thought is like even if we had a complete description of the uh, physical states uh, of the brain, you know the, the 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 physical neural processes going on in the brain, even if we had a complete description of that, we still wouldn't really have an understanding of consciousness because we could we would still face this question of, well, like, why is it that these neural states are the ones that realize consciousness, right? So, you know, when I, when I sort of, when I look at, at, at a wall and I see a particular color, um, I'm undergoing a certain conscious state, I'm presented with a certain phenomenal property, you know, the, the whiteness of the wall, there's something it's like to see the whiteness of the wall. Um, and, and you can describe in, complete detail all of the processes going on in my head you know you can describe the uh, patterns of stimulation on my retina you can describe the information going down the optic nerve you can describe all of the brain processes going on um, and you know I mean that well I mean they're not exactly easy it's not that's not an easy task um, but uh, even if you do complete that task uh, it seems like there's still this further question of like well why would any of that stuff manifest as an experience of whiteness? You know, like, what, like why, right? Why? So, okay, what we have is this kind of uh, correlation, perhaps, between certain conscious states and certain states of the brain. But why does that correlation hold? Why is there that connection? Why do those physical states realize consciousness? And this is supposed to be a particularly hard problem. Um, a problem which just goes beyond, um, you know, scientific explanation. So there's something there's something special about consciousness, um, which means that it's not going to be susceptible to uh, normal scientific explanation. Now, <clears throat> you know, my feeling on this one is that um, I'm I'm inclined to think that there really is a hard problem of consciousness in this sense. You know, I, I, in the sense that consciousness like cannot be fully explained by science. But I'm not really sure that... So I, I guess the, the, what, what my feeling is, is that I think that the same is true for literally everything else. Um, I think there's not just a hard problem of consciousness, there's a hard problem of everything. Uh, I think everything <laughs> um, escapes a sort of complete scientific explanation. And so there's two sort of... And there's two things that motivate my, uh, my intuition on this one. Um, so first of all, it seems to me that there's like just a whole bunch of, uh, I guess, explanatory projects, uh, you might say, that like uh, lie beyond the realm of, of the sciences. So, um, for example, consider, uh, consider the arts, right? Like, let's say that I'm looking at a painting, say, Goya's dog, and, um, and I say that Goya's, uh, the, the negative space in Goya's dog painting has a melancholic quality. And I want to explain this. I want to explain why is this melancholic, right? Why, why does this evoke melancholy? Um, or I might, uh, you know, be thinking of John Cage's 433, and I say, John Cage's 433 dissolves the duality between art and nature. Why? Why is this? I want to explain why this is. I want to explain how it is that 433 dissolves the duality between art and nature. Um, so, okay, when we're engaging with art, when we're engaging in, like, aesthetic appreciation and interpretation, we're, you know, we're, we want to explain stuff, right? We give explanations. Um, but the thing to, I mean, the thing to notice about this is that it seems like if you were to answer either of these questions by, you know, giving some sort of scientific model, by, you know, giving a kind of reductive model or causal mechanical model or something like that, I mean, you would just be completely missing the point. Uh, that would be a, a joke of a response, and it would actually perhaps be quite funny. Um, like, that's how much of a joke it would be. Um, 
you know, like when you when, when I say like, OK, um, wh why is uh, the negative space of Goya's dog melancholic or like why, why does 433 dissolve the duality between art and nature? Clearly, I, I mean, I, I think clearly um, this is just not a, something that is even it doesn't even seem to be susceptible to scientific explanation. Uh, the explanation in these cases would, you know, it would appeal to um, so, I, I mean, it would appeal to all sorts of different things, right? It could appeal to, um, if we're talking about a painting, then, you know, we, we're going to talk about the symbolism, the representation. We're going to talk about, you know, the formal properties of the painting. We're going to talk about things like atmosphere. Um, we're going to maybe talk about uh, people that are depicted in the painting. I guess we wouldn't be talking about that if we were talking about Goya's dog, but, you know, <laughs> uh, even so. Um, the explanation would involve relating the artwork to other artworks it would involve looking at looking at the artwork as um, a particular piece within a broader <clears throat> artistic tradition um, and so on and the point is is that if you were to you know to give a complete ex so to give a complete description of the physical facts um, about a painting or about something like John Cage's 433 uh, would just miss all of that like it just you know, it it wouldn't um, it it wouldn't it wouldn't do any of those those things, right? Like it wouldn't, um, uh, yeah. I mean, it just wouldn't do that, right? A, a description of the physical facts is not going to be a description that like locates the painting within a particular art tradition or talks about the painting in terms of you know the symbols of the painting or the atmosphere of the painting even. Um, now, one of the things you could do, of course, is you could, I suppose, construct a sort of scientific model where the model is, the model sort of provides a description of the painting and then also a description of our reactions to the painting. So I could construct a model, as it were, of the uh, of, of sort of human brains and uh, why they react in a particular way. So with something like Goya's dog, you might say, well, I can give you a causal model of like what types of things provoke particular emotional reactions in human observers. And then that explains why uh, the, the painting is melancholic. That explains the melancholic quality of the painting. But I actually think that this sort of explanation just, I mean, you can do that, it's fine, right? But it doesn't really seem to address, it, it's not the kind of explanation we're looking for when we're talking in the context of artistic appreciation and artistic interpretation. Um, it, it just changes the subject. I mean, so, you know, imagine if I was to ask, like, why does salt dissolve in water? Uh, and then you answered that by constructing a causal model of how human brains react uh, when, you know, when they observe salt and water and so on. That just misses the point. Um, and, and again, that, that, that may be, you know, you may have constructed a perfectly accurate model, but it would still completely miss the point. It wouldn't really provide the sort of explanation that the person is looking for. Um, and I think that's also the case when, you know, we're talking about art, right? Like the, the explanation of the melancholic quality of Goya's dog that explains it in terms of, you know, like the causal processes in the brain, that seems to me to miss the point. Um, so I think that <clears throat> if we think about artworks, it seems to me that there's a sense in which giving a complete description of the physical facts doesn't fully explain. Um, it doesn't give a complete, there's still, you know, there's still sort of things we want explained about those artworks. And, that expl and those explanations have to come from somewhere else. They're just not the sort of explanations that are provided by science. Um, now, of course, I'm just talking about artwork here, but... Uh, I think that the, <laughs> I, I would say that this has um, more general consequences because it seems to me that basically anything can be an artwork or at least anything can be interpreted aesthetically. Anything can be an object of aesthetic interpretation. Um, and I mean, I, I chose uh, John Cage's 433 as my other example for a reason here, right? You can, in the case of 433, you can uh, apply 433 to anything, right? I can I can perform 433 anywhere I want. So I can take, um, it, it seems to me anyway, I can take pretty much anything in reality um, as being, I don't necessarily want to say an art object because I think that, uh, you know, talking, I mean, that, that's going to raise uh, questions about what exactly counts as art, but I can at least take it as 
an object of aesthetic appreciation, even aesthetic interpretation. Um, so, you know, no, no clear distinction between sort of aesthetics and the rest of reality. Uh, so that's one reason, I think, why uh, everything, <laughs> everything uh, has this kind of hard problem. Um, OK, so, yeah, one reason why I think there's a hard problem of everything is because it seems to me that there are certain explanatory projects that are outside the realm of science. Um, the other reason, and I'm, I mean, I'm not really so sure about this one, but uh, I'm going to say it anyway. Um, the other reason is, if we think about the kind of cases where we supposedly have easy problems, right? Um, like, let's, let's take, for instance, uh, water uh, and uh, attempting to explain, like, the manifest properties of water. So we want to explain, like, why water is a liquid, or we, we want to explain the liquidity of water. And we do that by sort of breaking water down into its constituent parts. So, you know, we now have uh, very detailed uh, models of, you know, like, H2O molecules and how H2O molecules behave. We have these detailed models of the, you know, the molecules and the sort of forces that obtain between them. And then given, given that understanding of the underlying structure of water, that, I guess the thought is, well, that makes it completely intelligible, like how water has this property of liquidity, um, how the property of liquidity sort of, it, it's just clear that the property of liquidity sort of follows from the way that water is constituted um, in terms of its underlying microstructure or something like that. You know, I want to suggest that, you know, Hume, <clears throat> well, it wasn't, it wasn't just Hume, but lots of people have suggested that there is no conceptual connection between causes and effects. So, you know, I mean, Hume, most famously, I think, makes this point that, look, from any given cause, you can imagine any effect could occur. Um, so if I imagine one billiard ball rolling along a table and connecting with another billiard ball, obviously, you know, because we've observed this sort of thing happen many times, we expect that, that what will happen is that the second billiard ball will move. But, I mean, there's no kind of conceptual or logical necessity to that. Um, it could be the case that the first billiard ball rolls along the table, um, it touches the second billiard ball, and then the second billiard ball explodes, or the second billiard ball starts spinning, or the second billiard ball uh, suddenly shrinks and disappears. Anything could happen, right? What, what a la the reason why we expect um, the second billiard ball to start rolling in a particular direction is because that is what we have actually observed, That, at least in similar scenarios like so in most sorts sorts of scenarios like that where we have like one ball rolling and hitting another ball we observe the second ball rolling um so it's it, it but there's no like logical connection there so in the same way as that there's no kind of conceptual or logical connection between cause and effect i kind of want to say that there's no conceptual connection of constitution um so i guess the thought is this like However it is that H2O molecules are described, why is it the case that that must manifest itself as liquidity? Um, like, so, okay, we have this, this kind of model of H2O molecules, right? And then we have this, so, so with water, right, there's the manifest property. The manifest property is liquidity. And then there's this underlying microstructural, or a whole bunch of underlying microstructural properties. Um, and, and let's just say that it's H2O molecules. Um, I mean, that's obviously a bit of a simplification, but, you know, we'll, we'll just go with that simplification. So we have this manifest property of liquidity, and then that's explained by citing these, the, the, the underlying microstructural uh, features of H2O molecules. Why must it be the case? So, but why couldn't it be the case that you have that underlying microstructure, but then that just manifests in some completely different way like that manifests as solidity like wh why not um i mean it seems to me that look i can you know <laughs> i can write a story at least of a world where we have a bunch of h2o molecules um with you know just the same sorts of forces that obtain between them as, as in the real world so you know the the underlying microstructure is the same as it is in the actual world but then that just fails to manifest as liquidity um, now, you could say, well, <clears throat> the world I'm describing is not a possible world. Maybe, uh, but that, I mean, in this context, that seems to be kind of question-begging, because 
Like, why isn't it possible? Um, why isn't that a possible world? I, I guess that's another way of asking, um, uh, why do these connections or correlations between the underlying microstructure and liquidity, why do those hold? Um, so, I mean, that's really the, the, the question, right? Why must it be the case that the, um, the underlying microstructure uh, constitutes a particular manifest property? Why is it the case that this collection of H2O molecules manifests itself as liquidity rather than as something else? Why must that be the case? Now, notice, of course, that's, that's basically the same question we have in the case of consciousness. We say, well, you know, we've identified that um, may, maybe let's say we have a theory which, by which we identify that, you know, OK, there's a, whenever you have a conscious state um, that's correlated with um, certain neural states, certain physical states of the brain. Or whenever you have an experience of redness, uh, that's correlated with certain specific neural states of the brain. Um, OK, well, you can ask, why do those correlations hold? I mean, and that's basically the uh, the hard problem, right? Like that's that's the hard problem of consciousness. It seems like, well, you could have those physical states um, without the experiential states. Um, it, do, it it seems like from the description of the physical states, we haven't ex what we haven't explained is why those correlations or connections to consciousness hold. Um, but then, I can't help but feel like that's the case with everything, isn't it? Like, why, right, why is it the case that the underlying microstructure of water manifests itself as liquidity? Um, I don't see any, like, it doesn't strike me as being, um, I don't know, like, logically incoherent or something to s sort of imagine a world where you have that microstructure, but you just don't have liquidity. You have solidity or something, right, or just something else. Um, and so... You know, I think that this this kind of why question is is sort of still there. Like, why does it, why does this correlation hold? I, I mean, I guess in general, when it comes to giving explanations, um, the why questions can be extended indefinitely. I mean, you know, the thing that sometimes kids do, where they just ask why, 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 what? Right? They just endlessly ask why. Um, well, I mean, look, that might be annoying, but of course you can do that. And it's not really clear that there's anything sort of, I don't know, rationally illegitimate about doing that, right? Like, um, I mean, yeah, why, like, why not? Um, why not just ask why again and again? When you're faced with one of these sorts of uh, endless series of why questions, I mean, at the end of the day, so why questions can, can continue indefinitely. And then it seems like there's really only going to be three ways to stop them. Um, so one option is to say, when somebody asks a why question, one option is to say, well, there actually just is no explanation. It's a brute fact, right? So we're just at the level of brute fact. Um, the other option is to say, I don't know, right? Somebody can ask, why is this the case? And you can say, I don't know. And then, of course, the other option is to just walk away. Somebody can ask, why is this the case? And you can say, you know what, I'm done with this conversation. That's what usually happens when kids ask why constantly. Eventually, you just get to a point where you, uh, you say, you know what, I'm done with this conversation. I'm walking away. Um, so, of course, the, uh, <laughs> like, the, the, only, um, <laughs> the only option there that's really sort of, um, I, I suppose, that really gives an answer, right, is like the brute fact option. It seems like eventually we just get to a point where, you know, we, we, we end up with a kind of brute fact. Um, like in the case of <clears throat> water, okay, so uh, H2O, so like why is water, uh, wh why, why does water have this property of liquidity? Um, how do we explain the property of liquidity? Well, we break it down into H2O molecules, but then you can ask why is there this, um, this kind of, connect like why is it the case that the H2O molecules manifest as liquidity? They just do. It's just a brute fact. Um, of course, you could say the same with consciousness. Like, why is it the case that these physical states of the brain manifest as consciousness? Well, it's just a brute fact. Now, in one case, it seems like... Um, so, in the, in the case of water and H2O molecules, that particular brute fact seems to be intellectually satisfying to people. It seems to sort of scratch the intellectual itch of explanation. Um, in the case of consciousness... That's not so, right? Like when we when we explain the all of the processes going on in the brain, well, that doesn't scratch the intellectual itch. Um, but 
I don't know. I mean, <laughs> uh, that seems that seems to be um, purely a matter of sort of people's psychology. You know, I mean, some people find the the explanation satisfying, some people don't, and that's it. Um, but I, I guess my point in it, the point I'm trying to make really in this video is, um, look, <laughs> there's so with with consciousness, the thought is, look, in principle, science is never going to fully scratch the itch there's always going to be this niggling sort of why question It's always going to be there just you know um, it's never going to be fully resolved what i'm suggesting is well maybe that's the case for literally everything um at least if you're open to it if you look for it maybe you can find that there's an unscratched itch everywhere um and so really there's a hard problem of everything well that's just a suggestion anyway